doing the YouTube live setup. Doing the YouTube live setup. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm also going to start uh, recording this meeting. Yeah. Uh, so we are in session now, and uh, I would request everybody to stay on the mute when you are not speaking. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, Kirit Ankal, Kirit Shah, uh, who will be the MC for the program and the host, host of this uh, program. So Kirit Ankal, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Achal. Uh, good morning to everybody uh, from California, those who are joining from United States, uh, all, uh, you know, from the different part. Also, good morning. Uh, those who are joining from India, you know, good evening. I uh, hope, uh, uh, you know, everything is okay in India. So today we are gathered here to celebrate the 152nd uh, birth day of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And obviously today is a very auspicious day, not only uh, for all of us, but for particularly for uh, the audience which is joining today, because there is a triple fold objective which we want to accomplish. First of all, normally this kind of meetings are being done by the organizations. However, you know, uh, in this particular scenario, the Patak family and uh, we are doing uh, this uh, particular uh, meeting. So again, on behalf of Patak family also, I would like to extend you very warm welcome. And of course, on my, my own behalf, as well as on behalf of my lovely wife, Smita. So uh, the, as I was mentioning, you know, there is a triple fold objective. One is that, you know, Mahatma Gandhi's message is uh, sort of uh, diluted to a great extent. Uh, people have thought that, you know, he has been responsible to get India independent, which is true. But at the same time, that's uh, only the partial truth because, you know, we have seen Mahatma Gandhi being, uh, you know, uh, so many things. He's a one-man institution. So in reality, a number of people, you know, such as Steve Jobs, John Lennon, George Bernard Shaw, Albert Einstein, Leo Tolstoy, Paul Buck, Richard Attenborough, Barack Obama, Suki, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Dalai Lama, Caesar Chavez, Ho Chi Minh. For a number of people, Gandhi was beyond politics. Now, again, you know, Gandhi is a lot of things to a lot of people. But uh, as, as far as we are concerned, you know, Gandhi's legacy needs to be continued for the second, third, and fourth generation. And his fourth generation is there, including the fourth generation of his, his, his children. So automatically today, you know, we are going to continue his legacy, uh, uh, not only uh, through the uh, lectures of uh, this uh, esteemed speakers. And again, on behalf of esteemed speakers also, I would like to, you know, extend you a very warm welcome. And the, 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 the four, uh, the three speakers are, of course, uh, Dr. Spodek, Dr. Joshi, and uh, Dr. Trivedi. Besides, you know, we also have uh, a great video message a presentation from uh, 11 Bird. So, as I was mentioning, you know, uh, we have to continue his legacy. And uh, in order to help us doing that, so, you know, the Dr. Professor Devrat Pathak has done a wonderful job of uh, creating the book. And that book is, uh, you know, uh, Gandhi's relevance in 21st century. So we are also going to, you know, unveil his book as well. So this is just a, a small uh, uh, overview of uh, what we plan to do. But there are two major, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, Gandhi has made uh, so many quotes, you know, and two of them I would like to recite here. The earth has enough resources for our needs, but not for our greed. Another one is our struggle does not end so long as there is a single human being considered untouchable on account of his birth. 
So there are two uh, special uh, words which Gandhi ji has coined: Harijan and Daritra Narayan. And our endeavor is, uh, as I was mentioning, is to to create uh, a lot more understanding about uh, you know the Harijan uh, and Daritra Narayan also that what Gandhi ji meant by that and why he created this because he wants the equality. And three things I have learned from his life: number one is dignity of labor. Number two, the classless society, and number three is how to be brave, you know, under any circumstances whatsoever, and not to be afraid of anything. So now, uh, without further ado, you know, I would like to invite, you know, Rujul Patak. Now, Rujul Patak is the daughter of uh, Abhijit and Varsha Patak, you know, who are also co-hosting this uh, particular program. And Rujul is going to start the program with the prayer. So, welcome, Rujul. Shoo, Tari, Lagi, 
सकड़े तीरथ जनातन मारे वैष्णव जन तो तेरे कहे जाने रे पर दुखे उपकार करे तो मन अभिमान रे वैष्णव जन तो तेने रे कही जे वैष्णव जन तो तेने रे कही जे वैष्णव जन तो तेने रे कहिए Today I'm going to talk about the author uh, uh first of all you know I have to thank uh, uh, you know Rujul and Rujul uh, as you must have noticed Rujul has got a flair for uh, classical so she has already displayed uh, a wonderful uh, reciting of uh, Vaishnav Jan which is the most favorite bhajan of Mahatma Gandhi written by Narsi Mehta so once again thanks Rujul now i would like to introduce uh, ruturaj who is the uh, son of uh, abhijit pathak and ruturaj is going to introduce the author of the book uh, uh, professor devrat pathak so welcome ruturaj and please uh, let us know uh, what we should know about uh, your grandfather <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about the author of the book Gandhi's relevance in the 21st century. The book was written by looks like there is some technical difficulty i don't uh, see or hear rutra ah, okay i can see rutra life and working hard i still remember seeing a big pile of books which he had read and had compiled notes on he was a voracious reader reading a book a day he had studied hard during his student life and had reaped the fruit he stood first in ba in bombay university and had won the James Taylor prize he also won scholarship and sponsorship from the Watumal foundation to study ma degree at university of chicago after earning his degree in the united states he returned back to india to pursue positions at gujarat university as director professor and head of department he was again invited as a fulbright scholar to teach at three american universities in early 1960s and he accepted this teaching assignment he was against waste waste of resources and time he always asked us to take food portions that we could eat and finish he saved unused portions of paper to write on he always asked us to turn off the tap while we were scrubbing our hands with soap take quick showers and not to waste water he used time very efficiently politely ending conversations phone calls and meetings when necessary during my high school and college days i used to enjoy many conversations with him and also his discussions with my friends on variety of topics such as politics religion nonviolence and peace sometimes when my friends came to our home and when my mom told them that ruturaj is not here they would say it's okay we would want to meet his grandfather and they would stick around to meet him and enjoy jovial conversations on different topics he believed in helping others and really went out of his way to help so many people <clears throat> came to our home to ask for his advice or help 
and he rarely denied it. He really knew how to build strong relationships and keep them going. People used to attend and enjoy his thought-provoking lectures. I still remember going to one of his lectures and enjoyed not only his oratory skills, but also the sheer knowledge and information that he presented. His numerous articles were published on subjects of political science, peace research, Sardar Patel, Gandhian thought, secularism, Jawaharlal Nehru, Indian nationalism, and India's role in the new world order. He was able to have an effective conversation with everyone, whether he or she was a school kid or an adult, whether the person was smart or an illiterate. At that time, I mentioned to him about the earthquake safety drills that we had in California. He listened intently and then asked questions. He also shared this info with a few administrators so that they could implement it. I always found a desire in him to learn new things. He made it a point to learn computer in his early 80s. In summary, I admire Gandhi and my grandfather and have learned from both of them. Thank you. Namaste. Uh Uh, Rutra, thank you so much. You know, what a wonderful introduction of your grandfather. Really enjoyed, and I'm sure that, you know, everybody in the audience also enjoyed it. So now progressing towards the program, uh, we have a wonderful uh, individual whose name is extremely well known, and she's a, a respected Srimati Il Ilam and Bhatt. She is the uh, a very important person to start the cooperative movement uh, uh, in India. She's a Gandhian activist who found uh, SEVA, Self-Employed Women's Association of India, in 1972. She's a recipient of uh, Padma Shri and Padma Bhushan, both, besides a Ramon Magasase Award, which is like a Nobel Prize for Asia. She was also chosen for the Nivano Peace Prize for 2010, for her work empowering poor women in India. And uh, uh, also on November 2010, US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton honored Bert with a Global Fairness Initiative Award for helping move more than a million poor women in India to uh, position uh, dignity and independence. Hila Bert was uh, Sorry about that. Ila Bhatt was honored with the prestigious uh, Red Clip Medal on 27th May 2011 on, on the Red Clip Day for her efforts in helping uplift women, which had a significant impact on the society. In November 2011, Ila Bhatt was selected for the Indira Gandhi Peace Prize, Disarmament and Development of 2011 for her lifetime achievement in empowering women through grassroots entrepreneurship. So uh, anyway, this is what is going on. Uh, so now Ilaven uh, will provide her pre-recorded speech. Thank you. Namaste. Pranam. Salam. To everybody. By Abhijit Ben Varsha, a professor Harvard Spodek, and uh, uh, Doctor Respected Doctor Trivedi, and all all others of eminence friends. Uh, it is October two, twenty twenty one, and. I am joining you to celebrate the birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi and as well as the uh, inauguration of uh, Professor, our Professor Adhyavarat Pata, his book Gandhi's Relevance in the 21st Century. 
myself being his uh, student, we call him Professor Pathak, we call him Pathak Saib. In good old days I'm talking. Thank you, Abhijit. Gandhiji gave us two ideals that he himself said were his life values, central in all his work and life. That were Satya and Ahimsa, Truth and Nonviolence. And it is these two ideals uh, that come to my mind again and again in the recent months all the more. So I think the inauguration of this book seems to be very timely. I don't know how it gets into the structure. Uh, whether for three trusts, uh, trusts related to Sabarmati Ashram, or I talk in uh, open dialogue with Pizdati Kapit students, or, uh, you know, recently the celebration of Seva Sisters who took 20 years to save and build and move from a rented office to their own office. However, I am not, uh, I'm not uh, convinced with uh, what is all going on, where the base is truth? No. Ahinsa, non-violence, no. Satya, truth is evident and visible. And that to me seems the fact that over it over eighty nine percent of workers of our total workforce now they have been ninety three percent. Uh, they are men and women. They work in the informal sector of our economy and in our society. They are uh, like the like street vendors, uh, BD rollers, farm laborers, garment teachers working in the home, and those who uh, also those garbage pickers from streets, from big buildings, from government offices. Also those who pick up used computer keyboards from the trash heaps, they work. While our national census of India report them and count them as non-workers, is this truth? As an economy and as a society, as I say, and therefore, as a as a nation, we have not recognized this truth: who works, what is work, who is worker. We have not recognized this truth have not accepted this truth and not addressed this truth that 93% of India citizens work in informal sector of the economy. This untruth has worried me all my life and worries me now. Satya, that we have not recognized, faced up and addressed is that over also another reason forty percent of our citizens are poor in India getting poorer under this pandemic they are poor have less than rupees forty per day to live on yes we do have political slogans plans and institutions but in the end, our economic growth and prosperity 
is due to the poor. When there is growth, we grow, but poor do not. When there is economic slowdown, we survive, but the poor fall deeper into poverty. And keeping these poor people poor is hinsa, is violence. That hurts me all the time. And that we have done and are doing on them and therefore on us. This violence that is done on the poor, ultimately it, uh, it hurts us also. The violence comes to us also. Accepting poverty unpaid or paid or low paid and hard and honest labor is violence of the worst kind, however invisible and latent it may be. Let me state that poverty is violence with consent of the society. Our violence is not limited to humankind, our brothers and sisters, but goes beyond to all our living beings. We have accepted a way of living that overlooks killing and consuming. Killing and consuming other living beings by polluting air, we are committing violence. By polluting water, we are committing violence. By polluting the, uh, or, or rather, wasting food, we are committing violence. Violence on the poor, on us, and on all living beings on this Mother Earth. Let us seriously, sincerely, Think about Gandhi's truth and untruth, satya and asatya, violence, non-violence, ahimsa and hinsa. About these two truths and these two kind of violence that are central to all India and Indians. Time has come. When these truths overshadow all other truths, may it be our progress in science or development in education, more and more, but now time has come when these two truths and violence fuel all other conflicts uh, between caste, greed, religion, class and more, more. You are all, all knowledgeable persons. Uh, I'm not saying thing, anything new at all. However, need, needless to say that uh, Satya Ahinsa, truth and non-violence, are best put into action with the help of justice, Nyaya. And let us think about it again with all sincerity in our heart. This October 2, 2021 reminds us of truth and non-violence more and more than before. And uh, I think uh, Patak Sahib's book is, uh, uh, will also give you know, evidence to this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> As we all have seen, uh, we can share Hiraban's concern, I sincerely do, about nonviolence, about untruth uh, and truth differences. In fact, you know, for those who don't know, today is the International Nonviolence Day declared by United Nations in 2007. So, 
to to share eleven concern. Thank you very much, eleven. We really, really uh, are very happy that you share your views, and this is why you know Professor Patek's book is of utmost importance for all of us to not only to to understand, but to but but to digest and and continue Mahatma Gandhi's message to the masses. So anyway. Uh, in, in, in that particular uh, connection, I would uh, like to invite uh, Abhijit Pathak to introduce all three speakers, one after the other. And uh, incidentally, Abhijit uh, has uh, a tremendous amount of uh, uh, interest in his father's work. And uh, he, in order to continue his father's legacy, has uh, worked extremely, extremely hard on the, on the book. And uh, in fact, uh, he is instrumental uh, in helping me to create this program because he gave me the book. That was the mistake he made. But that unfortunately led me not only to read the book, to understand, digest the book. And I, I realized that you know, our mission should be to uh, uh, you know, carry forward Patak Sahib's message to the whole world, as many people as we can do. So, uh, so thank you again, Abhijit. Uh, for giving me that book, and uh, you are most welcome to carry on. You are muted. Uh, before I speak about the invited speakers, let me say a few words about Kirit Bhai. Uh, Kirit Shai is Emeritus Senior Medical uh, Science Director of Sanofi Pasture and President IRC Health and Care Foundation India. He is also Chairman International Forum Vichartha Samudai Samarthan Manch and a Member Advisory Board of Sukarma Foundation. He is also Healthcare Chair of Indians for Collective Action. Now, while welcoming our invited speakers, uh, let me begin with uh, uh, Professor Dr. Howard Spodek. He is a Professor of History and Geography and Urban Studies at Temple University. He graduated from Columbia University and obtained a PhD from the University of uh, Chicago. While a graduate student, uh, he visited India as a Fulbright scholar. Dr. Howard Spodek is the treasurer of the World History Association and a member of the editorial board of History Compass. Dr. Howard Spodek specializes in Indian history. He is the author of the World History, a college textbook that is sometimes also used for high school advanced uh, placement history courses. He won Temple University's Great Teacher Award in 1993. And his fields of expertise are modern India, global urbanization, and world history. In addition to books, he has published scholarly articles and has produced two very good documentary films. One is Ahmedabad, the life of a city in India, and the second, the urban world, a case study in slum relocation. Professor Howard Spodek, please. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this double celebration. Um, it's a celebration, of course, of Gandhi's birthday, and it's a celebration of the release, the publication, the launch of Devra Bai's new book, Gandhi's relevance in the 21st century. Um, I, was, I was listed as saying something about Gandhi, which I had not planned on, but um, you know, when we meet Gandhi in Devrat Bhai's book, he already is the leader of India's freedom movement. Uh, but historically, his life begins in Porbandar, in the princely states of, of Saurashtra, uh, and in Rajkot, the seat of the British administration for Saurashtra. It takes him to England, where he not only studies law, but begins to understand the British systems of law and of rule, comes back to India very briefly, and goes to South Africa, where he finds that his, his main role is not going to be as a lawyer in the courts, but as a leader of a struggle against injustice. He comes back to India, prepared to take on that role, and that's what he does. When we meet Gandhi in Devrat Bhai, Devrat Bhai's book, he already, he's a formed person. The book is a collection of lectures and reviews, some previously published, some published here for the first time. 
their dates apparently run from the earliest about 1990 to the most recent about 2004. Um, the places are not entirely given where he gave these. Some must have been lectures to his students. Some must have been published lectures and some were journal articles in journals of scholarship and pedagogy. To me, the essays in the book fall into three categories and I wish there were a little more. The first category is an analysis of Gandhi's own thought and action, its lasting importance. Professor Patak is not telling us so much of new analyses, but he reminds us that Gandhi's views remain important today and probably forever. Patak emphasizes the importance of the Gandhian value of Swaraj. Uh, everyone, I was giving definitions, everyone in this audience knows Swaraj and Swadeshi. Um, he, he also emphasizes trusteeship. This value is less emphasized in this book but it is here and it's critical for all of Gandhi's criticisms of the inequities of wealth, of wealth distribution and of the exploitation represented by capitalist economics. In his struggles for independence, he worked closely with and was supported by some of India's premier capitalists. To them and for them, he recommended trusteeship, the use of wealth for the benefit of the entire society. Let these capitalists remain wealthy, but let them see themselves as trustees of the nation's economic capacity rather than as seekers of personal profit. The Birlas and the Kasturbais of India appreciated this appreciation of their potential contribution. Also Gandhi's support for them provided them some protection from their socialist critics. These Gandhian themes in the book, Swadeshi, Swaraj, tr uh, uh, trusteeship, and many others, indicate Gandhi's choices for his own life, for his movement, and for his hopes for his country's future. They are presented as a package. We're not clear about the circumstances which led to Gandhi's adoption of these principles, nor did we understand the evolution of his thinking, how he got to these positions. He didn't just, he wasn't just born with it. The second main theme in this collection is an analysis of the most significant developments in political life, broadly understood, in the 20th and the early years of the 21st century, with some references to earlier historical developments. Professor Patek held numerous degrees. We've heard about them already, particularly I know the MA from the University of Chicago, where I also studied. Ultimately, Professor Patek's political assessments are his own. They're based on very wide reading, as we've heard, and supported throughout with copious bibliographical uh, references. The list of developments is comprehensive. And Patak is careful to note that despite the horrors of this time period, the destructiveness of warfare, there have also been many beacons of hope. He balances this, the, the, the trends of destruction and the trends of hope. On the negative side, he cites violent, and these are quotes, violence, wars, and Holocaust, poverty, hunger, and destitution, repression of liberties and human rights, and echo disaster leading to environmental crisis, paucity of resources and pollution. I was surprised at how much attention he gave to ecological issues in, even in the 1990s. On the side of optimism are at the governmental level, numerous international treaties, even treaties governing the rules of warfare. And on the personal level, a vast multiplication of NGOs, as more and more individuals have become involved in the work of conflict resolution, economic development from the bottom up. It's good that we have Ilaben with us. Equality and women's rights. It's good that we have Ilaben with us. So even in the face of menacing disaster, Dr. Patak, like Gandhi, holds out room for hope if only we work with commitment and diligence. Among the signs of hope is the development of a new kind of education based in peace studies. And peace studies are the main theme of the third, of the third main theme in the book. This was the area of, Pat of Dr. Patak's most significant contribution to scholarship and activism. From 1980 the, uh, until the year of his death in 2006, Professor Patak taught peace research to MPhil and PhD students at the Gujarat Vidyapit. 
the educational institution that Gandhi himself founded. In this work, Patak allies himself with the pioneers of peace studies, notably Johann Galtung, and sees all of them in communion with Gandhian thought. What are peace studies? This discussion appears, this is probably the biggest theme in the book really. This discussion appears woven throughout. Chapter 12, Building Cultures of Peace, the Role of Peace Education and Conflict Resolution provides the fullest explication. It's not presented systematically, but the key points are, in addition to the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic, peace education says we should deal with negotiation as a basic skill. We should deal with a fourth R, reconciliation. Second, peace education must go beyond opposition to war. It must, quote, encompass the holistic approach, embracing the need for human liberation, covering human rights, basic needs, questions of poverty, repression, racial discrimination, malnutrition, literacy, and disease. It obviously involves a learning process for cultivating tolerance and engendering creativity. In terms of process, third, in terms of process, quote, peace education in essence is self-education. It's a consciousness raising and consciousness changing exercise. It's for all of us. Um, there, should be a participat there should be participatory methods rather than one way authoritarian approach. In the program of peace education, there will not be a teacher as we now have, but a facilitator. Periodically, Patak, Dr. Patak reminds us how closely these goals and methods correspond to Gandhian ideals. When I finished reading the book, three major questions came to my mind. One, the Gandhian message, the goals of peace education, seems so positive, so wholesome, so humane. Why have they been so difficult to achieve? Dr. Patak uh, devotes many pages uh, to talking about warfare and inhumanity throughout the world. And he does not shy away from the problems within India itself. In short, what are the Gandhians? What are the students of peace up against? What is the arsenal of their opponents that makes these opponents so powerful and so difficult to, to confront successfully? Second, what did Devrat Bhai actually teach at the Vidyapith? What were the requirements for the students? I mean, the book tells the goals, the ideals. What was the means? How did they actually do this? What were the requirements for the students? How were they evaluated? What would have been considered a success for a student of peace studies? Um, uh, 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 Professor Vidyu Joshi, who will speak with us in a few minutes, tells us that Patak was an active member and advisor of many NGOs, including for 15 years, president of the Gujarat chapter of the People's Union for Civil Liberties, the PUCL, and vice president of that organization at a national level for a number of years. These included many years when it was, it was a little dangerous and it took courage. To, to be in favor of civil liberties? Were his students expected to follow similar trajectories? Were they expected to do the same when they graduated? Um, and here I look forward to other contributions in this session. We've already heard some of, you know, what were the Gandhians up against and why? How did they actually train their disciples and what did they do? The book is an enormously valuable contribution to thinking about all of these issues. And again, thank you for inviting me to be here with you. Thank you, Professor Howard Spodek. Uh, now, continuing our uh, journey into uh, more learning from the learned speakers, uh, I welcome now Professor Vidyut uh, Anantrai Joshi. He is the former emeritus and now adjunct professor at Gujarat Vidyapit. Formerly, he was the director of Chimanmai Patel Institute of uh, Management and Research and also vice chancellor of Saurashtra University. Uh, he also held director positions in many other prestigious institutions in Gujarat. Dr. Vidhi Joshi has written 
and published 29 books, published over 50 research papers in more than 100 articles and around 1100 newspaper articles. Uh, Dr. Vidya Joshi is one of the prominent sociologists of Gujarat. He has developed regional sociology and contributed the same by his insightful sociological concepts. And his research writings and lectures cover a gamut of subjects encompassing sociology, Gandhian thought, political science, including systematic and logical analysis of election results, often predicting results with amazing accuracy. Professor Vidya Joshi, welcome, sir. Thank you, Abhijit Bhai. It's indeed a matter of pleasure for me to speak about Patak Sahib's book. Harvard has already spoken on peace and peace studies. I'll omit that part. I would rather focus on why Gandhian thinking is relevant in 21st century, which is theme of the book. The book has around 15 articles out of which eight directly address to Gandhi's relevance in 21st century, peace and security, Gandhi's direct relevance, search for a lasting peace and security, Gandhi's implication and potentialities of nonviolence, Swadeshi, and he has, he has addressed various issues. The articles were written somewhere in the last decade of last century and during the first four years of first decade of 21st century, where I was witness to Professor Pathak's work at Peace Research Center in Gujarat Vidyapit. Uh, in the article of the same title, Professor, I, I would rather take book as a whole. Whenever you read a book, read it as a whole rather than a separate independent article, then you will get a real feel of the book. Professor Bidian Pathak mentions that in spite of the liberal dream of a society with equality, liberty, and fraternity, the neoliberalism has brought curses like poverty, inequality, environmental crisis, lifestyle diseases, fundamentalism, and terrorism. Professor Pathak used to tell us that look after Kant told us about man as center of the philosophy, the world views were divided in three spectra. One spectrum was conflict-oriented ideologies and socialism. Second was freedom and competition-related ideologies turned into liberalism and capitalism. And third was humanism or cooperation and harmony-related ideologies where Gandhi belongs. Gandhi belongs to this variant of humanism, ethical humanism variant of humanism, where Tolstoy, Ruskin, Thoreau, Emerson, and other philosophers belong. Gandhi was slightly different from other ethical humanists in the sense that he had a, 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 an Indian background of anekantvad, pluralism of Jainism. He was a, an Advaita Vedanti, so he believed that everyone is equal. He had the middle path of Buddha with him. And along with this, he was influenced by ethical humanism ideas. And the issue is this, that a time has come that neoliberalism has come to a situation where it is finding various problems. And in order to solve those problems, we have no way out but the Gandhian philosophy. And that idea was emphasized first by Professor Devat Patak in and around 1992. Joseph Stiglitz did it a decade later. So uh, I would say, now what is that? Many people say that Gandhi has not given any philosophy. philosophy That was not the case. In fact, Gandhi <coughs> gave a philosophy and his program of pre-1940 era was based on this Gandhian humanism or ethical humanism part. Now it is our duty to see the Gandhian principles and evolve programs for 21st century. <coughs> so reading from Professor Devrath Patak's book, what is that 
Gandhian humanism or what is that Gandhian philosophy? Gandhi basically believed in issue of Swaraj. Swaraj is something more than freedom. Swaraj is something more than freedom. My destiny, I decide my destiny. That is the Swaraj. Some people argue that he was anarchist, but he said that enlightened anarchist is better than the strong system. Huh? He, he emphasized Gram Swaraj or decentralized polity and decentralized economy. This matters most because after some decades, Schumacher also emphasized this, that decentralized economy is more important. He emphasized on an egalitarian society, not equality in Marxist sense of the term, but a sort of egalitarianism, egalitarian society. He believed in constructive program by civil society. He believed that state should have less role and civil society should have more role, NGOs should have more role, and he also established several institutions in those days. So a sort of decentralized economy, decentralized polity, a, a, a sort of uh, local market. A and let me tell you that Gandhi gave local market emphasis in those days where environmentalists tell us that, yes, this is right principle. If I purchase something from US, it will come to India, to Ahmedabad, and how many carbon units it will generate. Instead, if I purchase something which is manufactured in Ahmedabad, it will have zero carbon. So environmentally, local market is always better than the international market. In, from this point of view, Gandhi said that Western model is not important. Dian Pathak has categorically emphasized that Western model is not important. We have to evolve our own decentralized model of economy. That's how it has to be there. Uh, Gandhi gave program, all Gandhian programs, Khadi, you may not believe, you may not believe in other programs, but then you may go by his philosophy and evolve new programs, which are more important. So before that, let me come to a point that how neoliberalism is facing problems. We know that neoliberalism has faced, is there with many problems. We have now the issues of inequality, issues of poverty, terrorism, environmental crisis is already there, centralization of polity, centralization of economy, rising of multinational corporations. These are all the issues. Joseph Stiglitz, who advised American government on liberalization, privatization, globalization, and won Nobel Prize in economics based on this, was disenchanted. He did it in 1980. And in 2003, he writes a book, The Roaring 90s, and says, I apologize before world community for wrongly advising Clinton. Market cannot solve all problems. Civil society has a role, state has a role, market at least can solve production problem, market can never solve distribution problem. So he had to leave US and now he is in Paris working with Amartya Sen on happiness index. So those philosophers who gave the philosophy of liberalism are disenchanted. Eddie Sofra, another researcher, wrote a book called Ethics and Development. He said that the other man is more important than me. Self has, and, and Gandhi has said this, when self becomes too much, remember the weakest and the poorest man. And if your action has done something for him, your doubt and ego will be melted. Now Sofra says the same thing. Don't do much for yourself. Do something for the other also. So ethics means to do something for the other that they also get something. Piketty, Amartya Sen, all these thinkers are now turning away from neoliberalism. Environmental scientists are turning away from liberalism. At that juncture of time, what Professor Patak says about 21st century is this. He says that neoliberal model has a centralized polity. And in Gandhian model, we will have to develop decentralized polity and decentralized economy and institutions will have to be created for that. 
Professor Pathak said that in, in liberal world, we have cosmopolitan big urban communities in Gandhian model, in, in, in ethical humanism model, we will have small towns and small communities and villages. Uh, you remember that you actually live your life in small communities. Ahmedabad is a city of 6 million people, but I hardly know 10,000 people. And that is my world. So our real world is always small community. That is what Professor Patak has emphasized. Then the, the, the liberal regime is based on military and real politics. Whereas the Gandhian regime, the humanist regime is based on non-violent world order. The liberal economy is based on competition. A, a, a mother will tell his child, don't give your textbook to your colleague. He is your competitor. So from childhood, we are teaching him a value of competition. But competition is just 20% of our relationship. 70% of our relationship is cooperation and we are not teaching cooperation. So in new economy, it will be based on cooperation and harmony. Remember, in India, M. N. Roy also told about economic uh, cooperative economy. Din Dayal Upadhyay also talked about cooperative economy. Germany developed it for some time, but this neoliberal situations has broken down our cooperative economy. So we will have to develop harmony and cooperation instead of competition that Professor Patak clearly mentions. We exploit nature. We exploit natural resources right from 1969 Club of Rome till Sustainable Development Goal. We find that we have exploited nature. The new, re new regime, which will be a decentralized economy and polity, will have a harmonious relationship to nature. We know Gandhi's sentence very well. I did not repeat it. We have now rising inequalities. Daily, day in and day out figure come out, 1% hold so much property, wealth of the world. But the new regime will be, Gandhian regime will be egalitarian regime, where a laborer will have respect will have dignity and machine will not dominate human beings. Gandhi was not against machine. Gandhi was against the domination of machine on man. If you are using machine for somebody's profit by exploiting somebody, then Gandhi was against you in this matter. That's what Professor Patak. Professor Patak has brilliantly said chemical fertilizer use is very bad and organic farming is much better. He has excellently said that. Then, rather than having a materialist worldview, which is a Western worldview, the spiritual worldview, having a higher goal of life, when Rujul was singing song, I realized the spiritual part of our life, that, that, that we have to develop. We have to unfold ourselves, our capabilities, rather than wanting things from outside. That, that sort of culture, and Gandhi was a great, cultural critic here that we have to remember. The liberal economy is capital intensive. In 21st century, we will have to develop a labor intensive economy where production, there will not be mass production, but there will be production by masses that we will have to develop. About health also, Gandhi was clear. Our health situation is curative pathy. We have develop unnatural lifestyle, and then we have unnatural li lifestyle diseases, several types of lifestyle diseases. Rather than we should have a curative pathy, live a simple life, be in harmony with nature, and evolve a curative system of medicine. So we may not have lifestyle diseases. So in this way, if you reinterpret Gandhian principles and do not strictly follow his behavioral pattern, follow his philosophy, and evolve new programs. For example, Gandhi gave 18 constructive programs. Today, those constructive programs will have to be shifted to environmental activism, 
human rights activism which professor pathak has also human rights activism mentioned and also cooperation between nations terrorism program rising violence program and such new programs will have to be based on ethical humanism that's what professor pathak said i salute professor pathak that he was at least one decade ahead of what stiglitz or amartya sen or piketty or mumbad you know so other people started saying so i welcome this book uh, i have not received yet the new copy but i have the original old copy with me and i reread the old copy for speaking this and i thank the organizer for giving me this small comment small opportunity thank you very much Thank you, Professor Vidya Joshi. Now we are inviting our third uh, prominent speaker, Dr. Mohan Tiwadi. He was born and raised in uh, Varda in central India, where his physician father had moved to serve village communities under personal summons and mentoring of Mahatma Gandhi. The family was greatly influenced by Mahatma Gandhi and his close associates. Dr. Mohan Trivedi played a role in organizing Narayan Bhai Desai's meetings and lectures, Gandhi Katha, at over 20 venues in USA. Mohan is also deeply engaged in facilitating publications of books by eminent U.S. scholars, uh, based in uh, Gandhian scholars based in USA, and he also supports authors uh, and propagate their uh, books and works to South Asian communities and readership by translating such books in Gujarati, Hindi, and Marathi. Five such books are already published and a couple more are in the works. Uh, professor Mohan Trivedi is also a distinguished professor of engineering at the University of California at San Diego and the founding director of Computer Vision and Robotics Research Laboratory in laboratory for intelligent and safe affordable ones. So a unique combination of advanced uh, engineering technology on the other hand, and basic Gandhian thoughts on the core. Such a wonderful combination. Welcome, Dr. Mohan Trivedi. Thank you so much. Uh, am I properly visible and audible? Uh, Abhijit Bhai? Yes. Very good. Okay, so uh, may I request uh, uh, that I get to share my screen? Sure. You are already on the main screen. Yeah, but I want to show something using. Okay, my... okay, okay. I know, I know, I know what you mean. I didn't so want I, to. Uh... I think Achal Achal will be able to manage that. Yeah, you may do that now. Thank you so much. I uh, would really appreciate this. Uh, you can do that now. All right, very good. Can you see it? Not yet. But it is saying Mohan has started screen sharing. Uh, yes, we, yeah, we can see it. We can see it now. Better here now? Uh, yes, yes, perfect, it? perfect, yeah. No locks. Let's see. Sorry about this, but we'll figure this one out. Yeah. We have several slides on the screen now. I think you have to start slideshow. Yes, I did that, but let me see. Uh, I have some technical assistance. Uh, Professor Devedi, just, yes. uh, just do a screen show, uh, do a slideshow on the PowerPoint you have on your screen. That's right. Which is the fourth right button. If you go to the bottom, uh, you can click on that uh, screen share. That's good. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, yeah. 
All right. So instead of ten minutes, I'm going to now get eight minutes. Uh, no, <laughs> but, uh, no, no problem. Please carry on. I am so delighted and honored uh, to be with uh, all of you. Uh, I will tell you that I feel uh, uh, a person who is not qualified uh, to be in the company of uh, scholars and uh, activists and uh, really uh, uh, Gandhian thought, uh, 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 what I should say, uh, students for all their lives. Uh, but I think uh, as uh, Gnaneshwar used to say that, uh, please listen to me as if a mother or my great teacher Nivrutinath would listen to my mumbling and still would not throw me out of the room. So as you will see, my title slide is really giving thanks to the organizers, especially to the Parivar extended parivar of uh, Devrat Kaka. And I uh, want to thank uh, uh, Ila Ben, uh, uh, Professor Spodek, uh, Professor jo Joshi for their comments right now. But more than that, uh, I have 300 pages of publications that they have done that I have been uh, reading for last uh, month or so. So I'm delighted to be here with all of them. As I mentioned, and as Abhijit Bhai was so kind in exaggerating some of the things I might have done, I want to clarify that I'm fully vaccinated, but I'm not a Gandhi scholar. I'm not, regretfully, a student or a colleague of uh, Professor Patak. But that might not be too bad for what we may want to talk about today. So as I said that I'm not exactly sure why they have invited me, but I have some guesses. First is that in my interactions with some of you, you probably have sensed my deep admiration for Professor Patak, his views, his writings, and activities without really coming in close contact with him. I recall playing in his house uh, with uh, my cousins and my uncle, whom some of you might have heard of, uh, while he was a student, his name happens to be Ashish Nandi, and he had not finished his PhD, but already gotten a job in Delhi. So he will come to Ahmedabad with a whole bunch of his uh, manuscripts and spend hours uh, talking with uh, his uh, advisors, and Devrat Kaka was one of that. And while he would go there, we would just play in the compound. But really, it was about 20 years ago that I started reading Devrat Kaka's articles in a Gujarati newsletter called Nirikshak. And I was, during that time, quite perturbed I have been out of India for 45 years, uh, but especially during that time, uh, I used to feel that what has happened to my Gujarat? Uh, what has happened to my Ahmedabad? Uh, and there were voices <laughs> like Devrat Kaka's and who would write with total objectivity, clarity, and nirbhayata, fearlessness. And that really gave me uh, I'm not exaggerating, uh, a tonic so that I could sleep well. I also, over the years, uh, started interacting uh, with various faculty members, uh, activists, uh, and people who are at Vidyapit who used to be there also. And that really also allowed me to get a better appreciation of the peace research work with which the center, with which uh, Professor Patak was associated for 26 years. I will talk a little more about that. 
finally, I do acknowledge that there is some nepotism uh, that uh, <laughs> this Parivar, Pathak Parivar has really uh, favored my presence here because they are just <laughs> very kind. But at the same time, I think this accidental occurrence in all of our lives that I was born <laughs> to parents who had uh, basically uh, left urban areas of Pune or uh, Ahmedabad uh, or training from University of Vienna on basically a call, uh, a letter <laughs> from Mahatma Gandhi to come and give what he has learned in some of these places to the village communities. And also another accident that I happen to have been born on Gandhi's birthday. So that's where it explains the name I got. But those kinds of things play a role. And hopefully this is not stuck. Yeah. So talking about this connection with uh, Vidya Pit, it is not just fleeting. Yeah. Especially the last two visits that I was there in 2018 and 2019, they were actually related. And this is the center where he worked for 26 years until 2006, where we, for again, sheer accident and good fortune, that we actually brought some of the books which were done about Gandhi by very eminent uh, theologians. Uh, and writers from the US peace activists. Uh, and they were published by Yagne Prakashan, which happens to be a very uh, uh, well-respected uh, Gandhian Vinoba Sahitya related uh, publication house. Uh, and obviously when I would go there, I would think about uh, Devarat Kaka. So in the next six minutes or so now that might be there, what can I add here? Well, I would like to say that Without talking about Gandhi the man, without talking about Devrat Kaka the man, can I talk about how I interpret from writings of Devrat Kaka, message of Gandhi, which is ever present and universally accepted. Also, I hope that when we are done, as I have learned to appreciate Gandhi a little better with the writings of Devrat Kaka and his colleagues, you might also, your paths, your journey uh, would also be properly illuminated. So this is the outline of his book and uh, people who have worked with him, uh, people who have written uh, reviews of this and introductory chapters on it have already spoken. What I want to do is really pull out uh, two themes, which also were brought out by the distinguished uh, uh, scholars, uh, uh, Professor Spodek and Professor Joshi. But I will give you a little sprinkling of what I think is helping me to distill from Kaka's writing uh, things about Gandhi. So the first part I want to talk about is about nonviolence and communal harmony related thoughts. Kaka writes, the 20th century excelled in its multifarious inventions, discoveries and achievements, but it has a dismal record of having the highest number of war deaths, registering almost 75% of casualties of the entire world history from the days of Roman Empire. However, in 20th century, he also says that that century witnessed a unique experiment of nonviolence on a vast scale, bringing down a mighty empire within a generation's time. Exercising high Im moral imagination, Gandhi has left a rich legacy that the world can ignore at its own peril. Martin Luther King basically said exactly the that same, same thing in his own words about Gandhi's influence. And Gandhi's path-breaking contribution can enable the world 
to invent a new and promising future. So he's Kaka Devrat Bhai Pathak is saying, yeah, that is fine. But we are living today where children are going to live in the future. And there is something that we all can learn and use for our future to make it better. How is that possible? Now, when he's talking about it, he's also a really a wonderful mentor, teacher, and public intellectual. So he quotes as a start of chapter 12 in, his, in this book, a beautiful quote. It says, every gun that is made, every warship that is launched signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, and hopes of its children. Sounds so much like, say, Dorothy Day or Thomas Merton or Jim Douglas. But remarkable thing Kaka did is that he identified this to a military general of great repute who happened to be somebody who became president also, Eisenhower. And this really is what is at the heart of why we think this experiment of nonviolence and uh, development of peace through activism with nonviolent means can succeed. Because even people who have spent their lifetimes in leading war efforts, they also recognize what Kaka is bringing out here. But how to do that? So education in his mind, in which a lot of people would agree, is at the foundation of that. And he's very specific. So he's not just a, a fuzzy uh, uh, PowerPoint presenter like a professor that you are talking to right now. But he's identifying that there are two main goals for doing public education on peace. So it allows you to build awareness and political support for the introduction of peace education into all spheres of education in all schools throughout the world. This is beautiful. The message is universal, global, not just restricted to Saurashtra or Gujarat or India. And the second goal, to promote the education of all teachers to teach for peace. Beautiful. He says, in a rapidly accelerating culture, it is all the more important that educators learn from their students. The modern role of the teacher as facilitator, listener, guide, rather than lecturer or retailer of knowledge. Education for peace, human rights, and democracy implies, demand, or indeed demands, such a relationship of trust and mutual exchange in our classrooms, in our public forum, in our exchanges on Zoom. In particular, he stresses that equality between males and females is a prerequisite for a democratic classroom. This is written probably 20, 25 years ago. Okay, uh, and the first one is that we strongly promote the view that the peace education should be a holistic process extending far beyond the school's walls into community life, the mass media and popular culture. I don't think anybody would argue with what he has written some time ago. But while he was doing that, I think it is also important for me to recognize that he was part of an institution founded 102 years ago by none other than Gandhi, and this is a picture of the foundation stone at Vidya Pit, where he basically says that without exaggeration, I can state that what I am doing today in founding of Gujarat Vidya Pit is by far the most significant work I have done in my lifetime. 1920. The persons who have gone through this, who have walked the uh, 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 
basically the grounds of vidya peet are who's who of freedom fighters of educators of leaders who have changed transformed not only that universities uh, uh, surroundings but entire world and one such individual who at the age of 4 years of age he actually in 1928 29 attended on vidya premises a vinay shala which was basically a kg type of a thing who eventually ended up becoming the chancellor of that particular institution and not only that but for me he is indeed the person who held my hand for 30 plus years every visit that i have made in india i have always gone to vidchi or met him somewhere and then he also came and spent several time uh, i mean significant length of time twice and i had taken sabbaticals while he was here going around so he has in his own words like kaka has written in his articles here basically saying why should or what should be the mission of peace education holistic education terms that we have learned and this becomes in my mind guiding light for what i do even here at university of california because this message is really not discipline specific place specific or time specific this one is universal and immortal message about an educational institution so i am going to end with something that i am pretty sure kaka would appreciate and this is in the voice of a graduate of vidya uh, peet asatyama so, patra ben sabha with that bhairavi i end my talk but i also want to mention who i believe is the target audience for today at least for my 7 8 9 minutes and these are the people who love ideas these are the people who never quit learning patak sahib has done that thing gandhi has done that until his final moment they have blossomed and learn something and gave something they are lovers of life lovers of music you cannot talk about devrat kaka without mentioning how his holistic growth was founded on his love for sangeet and people who are the change makers but not only those who have gone in the past but i see the youngsters in that room and on this particular screen here who are really the people who are going to take us to the gandhian non violent ever blossoming future where everybody everybody gets the equal opportunities for growth and for fulfilling whatever is their purpose in life thank you so much I'm truly humbled and grateful to be a part of this wonderful celebration today. Mm-hmm. On behalf of the entire Patak family and Professor Patak's extended fa- family, consisting of his students, his friends all around the world, 
I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you. Just like Gandhiji would have quoted, happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. Today, listening to all the scholars, I'm sure you all will agree. We indeed felt the same way listening to our scholars today. A big thank you to Padma Bhushan Ilaben Bhatt, Dr. Howard Spodek, Dr. Vidyut Joshi, and Dr. Mohan Kiri. They spared their valuable time today to be with us. What you all shared today was both enlightening and inspiring. Our special thanks to Professor Dinesh Shukla and Professor Siddharth Bhatt for their contribution in publishing the first edition of Professor D.N. Patak's book, Gandhi and Peace Today. Today's program would not have been possible without the incredible support of Mr. Kirit Shah, who conceived and initiated this idea. Our special thanks to Achal Anjaria for arranging and taking care of technical details so that we could all meet remotely on Zoom. He organized minute details, handled all pre-recorded MP4 videos, and did help in timely execution of the program. Thanks to Umang Shah for creating the flyer, Jigisha Patel for photographs, Abhay Bhushan, Jagruti Desai, Pragnya Dadbhavala, and others for helping promote the program. Abhijit and me are very happy that our children express their feelings for their grandfather in such a beautiful way. Thank you all the viewers who spared the time for this program. Thank you. Namaste. Now we, we can also do the book unveiling now. Uh, by Mina Ben, uh, but uh, uh, she will be host. Yeah, she will be hosting the. She will be unveiling the book uh, on behalf of all of us. Mina Ben, you may please un uh, unmute yourself and uh, uh, you can say something. Yeah. Hello. Uh, this is the front page. The relevance in. Gandhi's relevance in 21st century. Okay, and this the the inside of the front page has the excerpts from the book. The last page has uh, Gandhi's two very well known quotes, and on the inside of the back cover has uh, the author's biodata and. I just want to say one thing that Gandhiji on the page 140 sums up in words, his own words, a person's highest duty in life is to serve mankind and take share in bettering its condition. In Indian opinion, 23rd February, 1907. So that is what I think is the real message from this book. And I was just supposed to show the book in holding uh, grandchildren. Um, and uh, I don't know if they have the photo of that, but uh, this is what I have to say. Yeah, yeah. these are the <laughs> great grandchildren. The great grandchildren of Devabharat Pathak. And from left, Anandi, Anitej, uh, Rujul and Dushyan Pota's children and Rutam Devij are Swati and Ruturaj Patak. <laughs> so they are all holding the book and that's, uh, that's the generation who's going to read this book. 21st century. Yes, that's <laughs> yes, for 21st century. That's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, okay, so, so uh, guys, I just want to, uh, you know, before I let you go, I want to make a couple of uh, very quick comments. <laughs> Uh, uh, Varsha, thank you very much for extending the word of thanks to everybody, including myself. You know, obviously, this was conceived with a view to carry the baton in the 21st century. And uh, 
we all are going to do that you know because the, that's the whole purpose of the the program that without lacuna we have to continue the message of uh, mahatma gandhi we have to continue the message of uh, professor mm -hmm. devrak patel i especially want to thank abhay bhushan to be here because abhay is uh, doing a gandhi camp uh, here in the san francisco bay area for last several decades and uh, he is inviting subaraji you know every year because of his uh, you know ill health unfortunately subaraji is unable to be uh, present or coming uh, plus covid is also responsible for his uh, not coming over here but uh, thank you very much abhay for continuing to spread gandhian message through the youngsters to whom you are educating every year year after year with tremendous amount of zeal and enthusiasm so so guys you know uh, uh, please continue the message of mahatma gandhi continue to spread the message of professor dev uh, devrat patak and uh, long live mahatma gandhi long live professor devrat patak's soul and thank you very much all of you for attending this program and in uh, book and book availability also is on the screen thank you ashal you 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 can disconnect now thank you